Former President Donald Trump and some of his top allies have been indicted by a Georgia grand jury for their alleged roles in a widespread plot to overturn the results of the 2020 election. Trump faces charges ranging from racketeering to fraud. And we should note these are state charges, which is significant because it means they can't be wiped away by a presidential pardon. Fulton County District Attorney Fawny Willis is giving the defendants until noon on Friday, August 25th to voluntarily surrender. For more on this historic news, let's welcome in our panel. Robert Costa, CBS News' chief election and campaign correspondent. Nicole Killian, congressional correspondent for CBS News. And Hugo Lowell, political investigative reporter for The Guardian. Nicole, let's start with you. After 24 hours later, I suppose, what is the arrest? What is a voluntary surrender even look like and how would it be handled? Well, we're still trying to figure that out, but the short answer is, as you mentioned, uh, these various defendants, including the former president, have up to 10 days to turn themselves in, and that doesn't necessarily mean that an arraignment would take place at this time. This is really just a period for them to be processed, and as we know, uh, the sheriff here in Fulton County has made clear that he intends to treat these defendants, including the former president, just like anyone else, meaning they could potentially get mugshot. So as you can imagine, just like the situation in Washington, in Miami and New York, where we have seen uh, the former president have to come in for uh, various proceedings and court appearances. Uh, security tends to be increased, and we expect uh, that we would see a similarly increased security footprint. Uh, we know that federal law enforcement has been here on the ground here in Georgia. So really, it's just a matter of when uh, the former president is expected to not only surrender, uh, but also eventually be arraigned. Especially important because timing really is everything here with three other cases and, oh, by the way, a campaign going on. Robert, give us a sense of what you think the trajectory is or the possible timing and schedule. It's so hard to predict, Scott, but based on what Nicole has been reporting in my conversations with sources close to Trump's legal team, they are going to try to push this down the road as much as possible. He will surrender, we expect, to authorities in the coming week, but there will be motions about dismissing this case, about how the district attorney has handled this case so far. Uh, but she has made it clear she is going to plow ahead. Uh, but there is going to be a real question from the Trump lawyers about the special grand jury that was convened to investigate this case and the status of a special grand jury versus a so-called regular, normal criminal grand jury. And this is all going to play out alongside the federal case. And different experts, legal experts in Georgia and elsewhere, have suggested to CBS News that the Trump team is going to try to make this a federal case, to push it off the Georgia docket and just let the special counsel be in command of the January 6th case. It's a fascinating legal, historic, and political question about how this will turn out legally in the coming months. Shifting it to federal court also removes all the cameras from the situation in Fulton County. Cameras are allowed in the court. America can watch those proceedings. Hugo, Give us a sense of how the Trump team is responding to this any differently than they responded to Manhattan, Miami, or the Washington prosecutions? I mean, not really, right? I mean, the Trump you saw in the days leading up to this indictment was a defiant Trump, and it's the same that goes for his team. And throughout the day yesterday, their primary objective was to try and counter-program what was coming out of the Fulton County DA's office, uh, and they were trying to get ahead of the narrative. And you saw this with a statement late in the evening when they vaguely suggested he had been indicted, when really he had no idea what was going on. Uh, but I think, you know, that's the posture that's been the case for the federal indictments in the documents case and in the January 6th case. And I think that's going to be the posture going ahead in this case as well. Nicole, what about that false flag charging document that was briefly published yesterday? What have court officials said about that and how that managed to happen? Yeah, this is really fascinating. I mean, it certainly raised uh, quite a hullabaloo, especially among members of uh, Trump's legal team who uh, basically say that this was a big fumble uh, on the part of the clerk's office. And, you know, yesterday, of course, we got a statement from the clerk. This was after a news outlet published an alert saying that charges had been filed against the former president before an official indictment had been filed. Uh, and so uh, today we are now learning from uh, the clerk office that this may have been an error on their part uh, that the clerk with such a large indictment uh, it's not unusual uh, that they would use 
you know, a pre-existing set of charges just to kind of test the system. And so that's basically what the clerk was doing, kind of doing a trial run and accidentally posted this fictitious docket to their website. And ultimately, they had to bring it down right away. Uh, the clerk's office now saying that they understand the confusion that this matter caused, given the sensitivity of this case. But again, uh, it has raised some questions uh, about uh, the integrity of the process and certainly something that the former president and his legal team has been seizing on. Setting up for quite a week next week, let me show you the calendar. As we have on the calendar for now, with the idea that things could be added, Wednesday, August 23rd, is the GOP primary debate, first one of the season. The 25th is that surrender deadline, Nicole referenced, for Donald Trump to voluntarily surrender before 12 p.m. to authorities in Georgia. Then Monday, the 28th, pivotal hearing here in Washington in the Jack Smith Special Counsel 2020 election conspiracy case. We could learn a trial date. We could add one more date to that calendar now, Bob, August 21st, a planned press conference in Bedminster, New Jersey by Donald Trump. What's going to happen at that thing? He's going to make false claims of election fraud, as he has about, about Georgia since the days after the 2020 election. This is a recurring theme from Trump, a refrain as part of his 2024 campaign. And he is being countered by Republicans, including Republican Governor Brian Kemp of Georgia, who came out today in a statement and said the election in his state Georgia was not rigged, not stolen in 2020. And Kemp is not just the governor, two-term governor, Republican, but also the former secretary of state of Georgia, who oversaw elections in that state as the top election official. And so you see in Trump's campaign right now this focus on 2020, 2020, 2020, as so many Republicans would rather focus on President Biden, on other issues. The challenge so many rival campaigns have when I call around is that they don't know how to get political oxygen in this mm -hmm. environment. They don't want to go after Trump directly because they think they could in some way alienate the Trump voter. Though it's notable that a lot of them are paying attention to former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, who's ticking up in the polls in New Hampshire. And they're saying to themselves, Christie is able to get some traction and attention in this environment, starting to get make some inroads in New Hampshire, not casting himself as someone who's forcefully anti-Trump in policy or ideology, but just saying Trump's the wrong person for this moment. And you could see at this debate a little bit of a sharper turn on Trump. But if he doesn't show up, again, how do they get attention if they're not going to bring up the four active criminal cases against the front runner? Makes it a lot more difficult if he's not there to focus on him. Hugo, there's a, there's a difference to this case. It has not only a local charge, a local set of charges, but it may have different complications for the prosecution, for the defense. What complications could either side face here? Well, you know, I think from the prosecutor's side, they're looking at the expansive RICO statute in Georgia that requires prosecutors only to show uh, an interrelated uh, pattern of racketeering activity in which to bring this wide RICO case against the former president and 18 other defendants. And I think even the Trump lawyers recognize the fact that or the way that the, the, the RICO statute works in Georgia may cause them problems down the line. You know, that being said, you know, what we were talking earlier about uh, the Trump lawyers wanting to remove this case potentially to federal court, that could cause complications for uh, the district attorney's office because they will have to litigate this. And if they do want to get to trial soon, that's going to be something that uh, injects delay into the process. And as we know, you know, Trump's playbook and overarching strategy is always to delay. Hugo, Nicole, I know it's got to be sweltering there. Thanks for joining us. Bob Costa, as always, thank you too.